Hello, welcome. I'm Olivia Mattis, and I'm delighted that you've joined us here, and I'm welcoming you on behalf of my organization, the Souza Mendez Foundation. We honor a hero, a rescuer of World War II, and many Sundays of the year we present stories on, on rescue, resistance, and other beautiful optimistic stories of hope. And today you had the opportunity to see a landmark film called My Knees Were Jumping, Remembering the Kinder Transports. And this is a film that was made by Melissa Hacker in the early 1990s. Melissa, the filmmaker, is with us here today. She is not only an award-winning filmmaker, she also now is the director of the Kinder Transport Association. So uh, she and I have that very special thing in common, just as my father was saved by our hero, Aristides de Souza Mendes. And it's now my life's work to tell the story of Souza Mendes. So it is with Melissa that her mother benefited from the Kinder Transport program, and now it is her life's mission to make this very important story known. So Melissa will be our first speaker today, Melissa Hacker. After Melissa, we have Rachel Dayhill Fuchel. Rachel is actually in the film, so is her father. And so are other members of her family. So um, Rachel will go into her own family story, the, the history, the dynamics, the transmission of memory, all of the things that Rachel wants to tell us. She herself is a counselor and an educator, educator and has thought deeply about the psychological aspect of the kinder transport story. And our third speaker will be Dr. Susan Miro, MD, PhD. She is a psychiatrist and a medical researcher. She also is a former interviewer with the Shoah Foundation uh, of Steven Spielberg. Um, she is also the daughter of a Holocaust refugee, not to do with the kinder transport story, but she has thought deeply about these issues. And she's here sort of as an outsider, insider, outsider, to give us her perspective on the psychology um, of the first generation, the second and third, and all of the dynamics involved in this story. So I think you're in for a fascinating hour. And without further ado, let me turn the floor over to Melissa. Melissa, the floor is yours. Okay. So hi, uh, thank you all for being here today. And in the future, as I know this is going to live somewhere online. Um, as Olivia noted, I'm the daughter of a kinder transport survivor from Vienna and a filmmaker who made one of the earliest films about the kinder transports. My knees were jumping, remembering the kinder transports. First slide, please. So uh, that's me filming with my mother. She is the kin and she is being fairly patient in this instant. Uh, my mother shared fragments of her life as a Jewish child in Vienna when I was very young. I can't remember ever not knowing something isolated bits and pieces that I could never connect to tell a linear story. My mother wanted me to know what would happen so that I would be prepared when it happened again. Her parents, like so many others, could not believe that the rise of Nazism happening in Germany would happen in Austria. After the Anschluss, when Hitler marched into Austria, they tried to leave as a family, but were not able to, as my mother and her mother were born in Vienna and they were on the Austrian quota to the US. My mother's father was born in the Bukovina, which is now Ukraine and was then Poland. And he was on the Polish quota to the US and his number was not coming up. My grandmother would not leave without him. So they put their 12 year old daughter who had never before crossed the street alone on a train carrying refugee children to England. She did not know that she was one of thousands of children saved by the kinder transport. The Kinder Transport was a rescue mission that saved close to 10,000 children, mostly Jewish, from Germany, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Danzig, and Poland in the nine months before World War II by taking them to safety in the United Kingdom. 
They survived the war in foster homes, hostels, schools, farms, and some older teenagers were sent to internment camps. The kinder transport to the United Kingdom was not meant as a path to citizenship. It was a visa waiver scheme. And the plan was for the children to return home when it was safe. The United Kingdom had experience with missions of this sort, having before taken children from Belgium during World War I and children from Spain during the Spanish Civil War. December 2nd, 1938, the day the first kinder transport arrived in Harwich, England, by ferry from Hook of Holland after traveling by train from Germany, it was a bit of a media spectacle with newspaper photographers and newsreel cameras filming. And that's where several of these photos are from, like this one and the next. The kinder transports were a massive effort created and sustained by volunteers and refugee organizations, Quakers, Jews, and others. There were many committees and individuals who made the kinder transports happen. After the violence of November 9 through 10, 1938, a consortium of British Jews arranged for Quaker volunteers to travel to Berlin. There they met with members of Jewish communities in Germany and Austria and learned that Jewish parents in the Reich would be willing to send their children away. That was a big question. Would parents be willing to send their children away? The report concluded that unaccompanied children should be granted entry into Britain. A Quaker and Jewish delegation met with the Home Secretary and there were debates in Parliament in mid-November 1938, which you can read online. If you look up the Hansard hearings, it's H-A-N-S-A-R-D hearings. They're really interesting. The Kinder Transport Rescue Mission was approved to permit an unspecified number of children to enter the UK. The children were labeled trans migrants and a 50 pound bond was guaranteed for, was required for each child to guarantee that they would not become a burden on the state. So many appeals were made to um, the people of the United Kingdom to make them aware of what was going on and also to fund the 50 pound guarantee because people, Jewish families in the Reich did not have this 50 pounds. For example, the Archbishop of Canterbury filmed a request for Britons to donate to the Lord Baldwin Fund, which had set up a sort of pool of funds. And this plea was shown in movie houses. Local committees formed to take children into towns and cities throughout England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. This was done in haste as the first kinder transport left Berlin on December 1st, 1938. And here are children at Dover Court, a uh, hastily converted summer camp in the winter where the children who didn't have places to go were, were waiting to be sent to families or foster homes or hostels. Next slide, please. The kinder transports from Czechoslovakia started in January, 1939. As Czechoslovakia had not yet been occupied by the Nazis, it had not been included in the original kinder transport agreement. This is an image of Sir Nicholas Winton, who you may know of, especially since the film One Life about his work with the kinder transports uh, was released last year. Um, here, here he is putting children on a plane to London in February of 1939 in Czechoslovakia. I was the very first person to use this footage from which this still is taken. Um, in my research at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., I learned that it was filmed for a universal newsreel, but it was never used. It was filmed and filed away in a file drawer. I found a note from the cameraman. He wrote that he was so concerned about the fate of the ch children he had watched being separated from their parents that he asked the pilot to call him when they arrived safe safely in London. But the pilot did call him. The kinder transports to the UK ended with the outbreak of war. The last train arriving on September 1st, 1939, a kinder transport survivor told me of arriving in London to hear the cries of newspaper sellers that war had started. Often, the last kinder transport is noted as a ship from the Netherlands that carried children who had come from Germany but were staying in the Netherlands and it took them, the ship took them to England in May, 1940 as it was a rush to get to the ship as the German troops marched in. There were also kinder transports in much smaller numbers to the Netherlands, France, Belgium, Switzerland, Sweden, Denmark, and the United States. Most of the kinder transport children never saw their parents again as they were murdered in the Holocaust. This, the current estimate 
is that the kinder transport saved 10 through 15,000 children from babies through 17 years old. This is a photograph of my mother's cousin, Polly. He did not escape on the kinder transport. He was deported from Vienna and murdered in Auschwitz at five years old. Over 1 million children were murdered. When we speak of the kinder transport children, we must also speak of those who were not saved by the kinder transports, their cousins, their siblings, their friends, and their parents and grandparents. Next slide, please. I wanna talk a little bit also um, about the Kinder Transport Association, uh, which was founded by Kinder Transport survivors in 1990 and held their first reunion in the fall of 1990. And that reunion, which was in the Catskills, um, in one of those old hotels that no longer exists, was where I filmed my first uh, filming for My Knees Were Jumping. So in the years after World War II, Kinder transport survivors who had spent time in the UK together in group homes, in hostels, schools, or farms had reunited as family. But it wasn't until the 50th year after the kinder transports that Bertha Leverton, a kind from Munich living in London, said, let's get together everyone throughout the world who had escaped Europe via kinder transport. So in June, 1989, on the 50th year after the kinder transports, over 1,200 people, kinder transport survivors with spouses and children, gathered together from the United Kingdom, Israel, the USA, Europe, Canada, South America, Australia, and even Nepal. After attending that reunion, Eddie Behrend, a kin from Danzig, founded the UK. I just saw in the chat that someone here had been at a reunion in 1999. So the KTA is a small but productive nonprofit with a dedicated team of volunteers. And we look both to the past and the future. We seek to honor this legacy, to support the kinder, to engage the next generations, and to make meaningful contributions to the world today. Our mission is to connect kinder transport survivors and their families and descendants, to educate about the kinder transport as an important part of Holocaust history, to support and advocate for children at risk, especially refugees and without parents. Next slide, please. I just want to say something about the KTA logo. When we redesigned our logo three years ago, Jen Fuchel, the KT2 who designed the original logo and the sister of Rachel, who is here today, explained that the kinder who followed, founded the KTA struggled with finding a visual representation of their feelings about the kinder transports and the groundbreaking organization that they were creating. So on the, the left side of my screen, the purple one is the original logo. So today, when we think of the kinder transports, a train or suitcase might come to mind, but the kinder then felt that the ferry from the Hook of Holland to Harwich was the key turning point, taking them away from the land they knew and cutting them out of their childhood. Jen brilliantly built on this idea and designed the logo with the silhouettes you can see of children cut out of a ship facing an uncertain future. Um, after 30 years, we felt it was time to create a new logo. As with the first, there was much discussion. The new KTA logo, as you can see on my right, um, features two children, one carrying a suitcase, the other a school bag, both wearing the kinder transport label tag hung around their neck. The older girl reaches out protectively and supportively to the smaller boy. The number on the tag worn by the boy is the number worn by Eddie Barrent, the founder of the KTA. The number on the girl is the number that my mother wore uh, when she traveled from Vienna. So, um, that is what I have to say for now. I'll be back. Rachel, the floor is yours. Um, I met Melissa at that first conference, uh, the first reunion in the Catskills um, on literally my 30th birthday. And um, people, you know, made a little fuss about that. And it was kind of nice. So, of course, I'm never going to forget that. But here it is 30, 33, almost 34 years uh, later. My dad's been gone now 13 years, um, and he was a very, very sweet man, a very good soul. And uh, it, it's interesting, unlike a lot of the other people that we met 
at that conference, my sister and I had always known the story that he had uh, been sent from Vienna to England. We always knew that. We knew that my grandparents had gone into hiding. Um, we always knew that. My grandparents always told me the stories because, as Melissa said, we were some of the lucky ones where everyone in my family, in my immediate family, survived. Uh, their cousins and all, I never knew. Um, so I, I can't tell their stories so well. Um, so uh, my dad was sent from Vienna when he was seven. As a, This is him as a young English schoolboy and probably his school photo. And he looks quite well adapted. I can tell you that he always shared that he went to London. Uh, he uh, Sorry, not London, Norwich. When he got to England, uh, their housekeeper took a look at him, stripped all of his clothes off, threw him in the bath and burned his clothes, something that you only hear about, um, you know, in sort of dramatic, uh, dramatic stories where people talk about burning clothes, but they burned all of his clothes. He'd been traveling for a couple of days. He didn't speak English. They didn't speak German, but they sat him down at a big chicken dinner and he did speak chicken dinner. So that to him was a very uh, welcoming thing, food as welcome, food as comfort. Um, and uh, that's always, that had always been a theme of my of my life as well. Um, he loved the Cohen family. Now, here's something interesting that I learned in Norwich, uh, which is a town in the Northumbria part of Great Britain. Um, every Jewish family in that town, in that city, took a Jewish child in from the kinder transport, which I always found amazing and very powerful. Um, I knew his foster brother, John. I knew his foster mother, Miriam. Um, and they were wonderful, wonderful people. And he loved them like family. And all my life, if I was visiting him on a weekend or it was a weekend, you know, we were home after, I mean, visiting him after uh, we got older and, and my parents were divorced. Uh, he always called every weekend. He called Miriam. Percy died much younger. My dad was uh, desolate when he died. He really loved him deeply. And John and he stayed very, very close until the end of their lives, which was within a couple of years of one another. Uh, interestingly, in um, two weeks time, we're going to be in Europe and in London. I haven't been there for about five years, but every time we go, you know, damn COVID, every time we go to uh, London, we visit with Roz, who is the widow of John, his foster brother. Um, and we always visit with her as I, to me, she's like extended family. I've never known anything other than that. Um, so after uh, the war ended and my dad was uh, reacquainted with his parents, you know, this is a very heartwarming story. It's quite wonderful that they were reacquainted. They were actually brought together in Malta uh, just to keep the geography a little bit uh, more meaningful. My uh, great grandmother, Verona, from whom I have my middle name, um, she uh, spoke English. She had been living in Malta. So they all uh, rejoined in Malta where my dad spoke English. My great grandmother spoke English and my grandparents could communicate through her. After Malta, they went to Toulouse and um, that's Tommy with them, the dog. And it was not an easy time for my dad to get reacquainted. He loved his parents. Of course, he knows that. But the there was still some uh, turmoil between uh, his English family and his Austrian family, who were greatly de de you know, delighted to be back connected to him, but had been through a very difficult time. They had literally been in hiding, mostly in South France, through the war. Um, I know that I would have had an aunt had their war not happened. My grandmother, Olga, um, had an abortion. Uh, I'm not sure how that was done, but the line was that she knew it wasn't the time to bring a Jewish baby into the world. So that is another loss from that time. And um, he, uh, he uh, stayed very close to both his families, which I think was a little unusual. Uh, this is with Verona, the grandmother, and this is actually in the small town of Barpassan, France, which is southwest of Toulouse. And I only learned this recently as in the last year, we uh, I, literally a year ago, we visited with a teenage friend of my father's whose granddaughter, she's now 93, whose granddaughter 
um, found me through the kinder transport uh, as she was doing research for her own senior thesis in college. She's from France, but she was studying in London and she wrote her thesis on the kinder transport, found me, shared that her grandmother was Janine, who was my father's friend after the war. He taught her English. She taught him French. And um, when we were reacquainted with her, when I met her for the first time just last year, she was holding my face like she was holding my dad's face. And I know that Olivia has spoken so much about the sense of hope uh, in the stories that we tell. And there is a great sense of hope here that relationships that were forged during this unthinkable time uh, developed into these lifelong connections of other people with whom experiences were shared that could not possibly be explained to someone who was not in that story. And now we consider that whole family, our friends, and kind of like family as well. Um, I think there's a, another photo after this. Yeah, so my dad, now they're living in France and like a good dutiful child of France now where they brought them in. First of all, their last name had been Fuchsel in, uh, in German, in Viennese German, F-U-C-H-S-L, which meant little fox and had the umlaut. But after after the war, the sentiment was to not have umlauts. No, no, no. So the name was changed to Fuchsel, uh, and it's pronounced in a way that sounds very French also. And that's my dad in his uniform. He's probably 18 or 19 there. He never went to war because there was no war to go to at the time, but he was ready to serve this new country loyally um, if need be. And then we go to um, uh, the shot from the film, me with my very red hair um, at that time and uh, sitting in his backyard. Um, my dad uh, had come from this very, very tiny family and my mother also had a very small family. So when they were divorced, he, he got remarried into a very, very big Italian family. And I'm certain that was one of his areas of um, interest was to have a huge family surrounded by cousins and relatives. And, and uh, so we were in his backyard here. And uh, I think there's one more after this. Yeah. And so Olivia asked me to provide a photo of like my dad's legacy. So aside from the fact that my father had uh, a, a new wife and three stepdaughters who also had children, uh, my sister, Jennifer, who you saw in the movie as well, who did the beautiful graphics, she does not have children, but these are our children, Jake and Georgia. Um, and uh, this was just this past spring. Uh, and my dad, I think, would be very pleased to know that Jake is a doctoral student in Arizona who votes in Arizona and um, that my daughter is a professional dancer um, and he loved the arts. So that's a little bit of our story. Thank you so much. And I'm going to pass it off now to Dr. Susan Moreau. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here. And I'd like to tell you today a little bit about trauma and what happened that we have this idea of intergenerational trauma. Uh, we know that trauma, the first slide, can impact people on three levels. First is what happened. The second is how you interpreted what those traumas were later on. And the third is how what happened and how you interpreted it changes yourself and yourself in the world, how you felt you fit in the world. And it turns out that this third part, which is the social part of trauma, is the most significant long-term for people. It changes who they are and how they relate to others. In the next slide, first-generation people, those of the kinder transport, were often told and felt themselves, we are the lucky ones because they didn't go to concentration camps, they didn't die, uh, but that doesn't mean that they didn't have trauma. And here are just a list of a few of the traumas that they had. They were hated by others, they were separated from their parents, they were hunted down, they had an uncertain future with caretakers that they didn't know, literally into the arms of strangers, they lost friends and family to the Holocaust. 
and they were murdered. Then they had no one to talk to that those issues about. They were just part of their lives. They had to learn a new language, a new culture, new customs. And for some of them, they even lost Jewish identity and the Jewish way of life. So it was a very foreign experience or a grating experience because they embraced their new life and they still had this memory of their other life. Back in the Bible, intergenerational trauma was talked about. And there's lots of ways that this paragraph is translated from Exodus. The, the Avon of the father is visited upon the sons and the daughters unto the third and fourth generation. It's translated in English sometimes as iniquity, but what it really means is uh, it's a complicated meaning, but the word Avon means bending or twisting that so the Bible perhaps saw that unresolved issues are passed on through the generations back to the third and fourth generation. And most recently, we have had such very interesting and marvelous evidence of how this can happen on a biochemical and a physical basis. In this, uh, in a whole field that in the last 20 years, but especially in the last 10 years, called epigenetics. We, knew, we know about DNA, which is pictured above, and how it twists and how it is our map of our genetic code. More recently, we have found that the way the genetic code, they used to say after it was discovered that the map is not the territory. We found that the way the genetic code is expressed how it turns into proteins, how it basically changes our expression of what's going on with us genetically is just as important as the genetics. And in the, in the little icon that it's showing on the second part, it's turning off the gene. So whatever that gene is, it turns it off. And there's a lot more detail about exactly how it does it these days, but we won't get into that right now. However, we have evidence of epigenetics in the Irish potato famine of 1845 to 1852. The mothers that were pregnant during this famine had children who, have, who had high incidences of schizophrenia, of obesity, of diabetes, high blood pressure, and heart disease. It was as if the maternal environment was getting the child ready for what they were going to have in the next generation. And perhaps that is why we are all survivors of survivors genetically. More recently in the Second World War, when the Dutch were fighting still against the uh, German occupation, there was also a winter of famine. 1944 to 45, and those children also had deficiencies at the beginning, but then they were born, they were later on developed uh, obesity, they had trouble regulating their uh, appetites, uh, they developed metabolic syndrome, which is part of the same problem of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and high blood pressure. So they had physical effects from the trauma itself. And they also had effects of all these folks had effects in their nervous systems. Now, Magritte, who's a very famous surrealist painter, expressed it in many of his paintings. He had a very traumatic childhood with a mother who committed suicide when he was a boy and he had lots of visual images of her walking, going out into the ocean and killing her, into the river and killing herself. And this is a quote from him, everything we see hides another thing. So the, the families, imagine the families on the left are the families that talk to their children about their experience in the kinder transport or any other time in the Holocaust. 
it made a shadow of the pattern of what happened to those people. But even the people who never said a word, and I certainly found this when I did the show interviews, that some of these people had never said a word to their family about what their experience was. They left a print like a negative image. You could see through it, but it made a shadow nevertheless, as we see on the right side of this image. So even the folks of the second generation, children like we have met, um, as we can see in the next slide, the second generation of the survivors of the kinder transport were the product of deformed, this means kind of bent love. I mean, the way the parents acted because of their experience influenced the children's experience, which acted a different way than other kids. So the images from the Holocaust or any pieces of their trauma were embedded in the next generation's mental structure. They felt responsibility for their parents. They had this odd feeling as Melissa expresses of being very protective and feeling also that their parents were very strong, that this duality as children, they carried fears, guilt and shame in their minds and their bodies for their parents. They struggled with goodbyes and separations and they felt a lot of pressure to prove their self-worth. Even into the third generation, these genetic and epigenetic changes went into the derivatives of the, the grandparents. Their own experiences, behaviors changed themselves and their future children. So it did take several generations to get back to a place that we might call normal. But if you think of it as adaptive, each of these generational changes brought more adaptation to the next generation. And we are all the survivors of everything we ever were genetically and everything we experienced with our genes epigenetically. And that's what allows us to go into so many different environments across our planet and even outside of our planet. Uh, in the last slide, I have some further reading for those of you who are interested. I especially recommend in terms of the Jewish trauma to look at Firestone's book. It's a wonderful book with a lot of heart. Thank you very much. Olivia, back to you. Uh, thank you, Susan, Melissa, Rachel, for your fabulous, fascinating presentations. Um, audience, please put your questions into the chat box. There are not yet that many questions. I'm sure you have a lot of questions to ask. So uh, now is the time to type out your questions and I will be moderating them. But first, let me make some announcements. So first of all, let me just say that Dr. Miro just gave you some further readings and it's okay if you didn't have a chance to jot them down. Uh, you will get an email later today um, that has a little button to press if you want us to send you those readings if this is something you would like to further explore on your own. Um, Right now, I want to tell you about what we have upcoming at the Sousa Mendez Foundation. So obviously, we have the Jewish holidays coming up in October, and um, I hope that the holidays are sweet for all of you. We will reconvene on Sunday, October 27th for a story about cultural resistance. And it's the story of the Paper Brigade, which is a group of poets and intellectuals who made it their mission to rescue Jewish culture and Jewish learning in Vilna, which was considered the Jerusalem of Lithuania. So we have a film, it's called The Paper Brigade, and we don't exactly have a trailer. It's more of a little excerpt from the film. So let's play that little excerpt so you get a little taste of the story.
Each person is a book. Each, uh, each mind is a book. We are a book. We are supposed to be the people of the book. But who is it the we? During World War II, the Nazis attempted to wipe out European Judaism. Not only the people, but their culture too. In Vilna, the Jerusalem of Lithuania, they came up against a group of men and women who risked their lives to resist the Nazis in the simplest way possible, by rescuing books, the pillars of Jewish culture. These members of the resistance are known as the Paper Brigade. I visited Vilna, now known as Vilnius, for the first time in 1981. It was the capital of the Lithuanian Soviet Socialist Republic. I knew very little about this city. Before World War II, Vilna was one of the cultural capitals of the Eastern European Jewish world. Its beating heart was the many prestigious libraries. From the moment the Germans captured the city on 24 June 1941, the Nazis persecuted the 60,000 or so Jews living there. For six months, Einsatzgruppe A, a unit that specialized in mass slaughter, rounded up Jews and marched them to the Ponach forest on the outskirts of the city. Men, women and children were forced to dig their own graves before being shot. The Jews who remained in Vilna were separated into two ghettos. One was reserved for those condemned to death, the other for those who could work. By October 1941, there were only 18,000 Jews left in Vilna, contained to a single ghetto in the former Jewish district. Okay, so that's just a taste of the film that we have coming for you. Um, it's a Belgian filmmaker, which explains the French accent. And it's quite an interesting story and a beautiful film. So now let's get to your questions. So um, we have several people wanting the readings from Dr. Miro. So as I said, we will send those readings to anybody who requests them. There'll be a little button to push on the email you will receive later. Um, question for Rachel, and that is, so your father was separated from his parents for all of those years and they left him as, I guess, a six-year-old, and they got him back as a, what, 14, 15-year-old? Well, from when he was seven to 16. He was seven to 16. Yeah. So can you talk about some of the psychological dynamics that went into their reunion? They had sure. left behind a seven-year-old. Suddenly, they had a 16-year-old. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting that you asked that because that's something we talked about quite a lot. My grandparents, my dad, uh, my family and I, um, they got back a, you know, a nearly grown man. And my my grandmother wanted to cuddle him up like you would a small child and, and squeeze him and, and, and kiss him all over and things like this. And my dad as a as a 16 year old boy was definitely a little averse to this sort of overt affection. And I know that that was probably painful on both sides, even though completely understood. Um, my grandmother uh, continued to be very, very overprotective of him. Uh, and, and then when we came along many, many years later, she was very overprotective of us too. Very, very fearful that anything should happen. The smallest thing, the smallest sniffle was, was reason for concern or worry. Uh, again, not to be, uh, I mean, completely understood, right? Um, uh, yeah, she was uh, quite a, a little bit of a worrier, and, um, but also had a terrific sense of humor that my dad got and that we all enjoyed. So, uh, you know, there are very, very wonderful things coming out that I'll, I'll say something that I always found very powerful, that I knew the story growing up, never questioned it, but it was only when my own son my first child turned seven 
that I looked at him in those big brown eyes and thought, could I send this child away? Could I, could I do that? And, you know, you saw in the clip, my dad talking very frankly, yes, very reasonably, intellectually, that would have been the smart thing to do. But my heart was in my chest. I couldn't imagine taking a child and doing that. So it was really overwhelming. Yeah. And they did become very, very close. And they did speak. Uh, they always spoke English together, uh, sometimes a little bit of French. Um, those two languages, they all spoke together. So they had left behind a German speaking child, German speaking seven year old, and they got back an English speaking 16 year old. Right, exactly, yeah. taller than they were and so on. Right, right. Um, so uh, Melissa, I think this might be for you. So there are the different populations of the kinder. There are those whose parents survived and who re were reunited there are those who are, I guess, the majority whose parents did not survive. I guess some of them settled in England, maybe others emigrated to the US or Israel or elsewhere. So can you sort of take us through the different populations in terms of what percentage did what and maybe who was mo the most successful in terms of their making their way in the world? So thank you, Livia. Um, so as, as I, often do when asked questions like this is I have to say that, you know, as, as many of you know, uh, survivors of concentration camps and so on did not begin talking until about 10 years after the war. They didn't want to speak. Nobody wanted to hear them. Um, the kinder transport children didn't start really speaking until the 1980s. And when they started to get together as everyone who was on the kinder transport, not just children who grew up in the same hostel or school together. And they weren't studied for many years. So, and the records are scattered throughout various countries and archives that often aren't speaking to each other. So in the past 10 years, there's been interest in the kinder transports and scholars are doing more studying and books are being written. Um, there's a book coming out that the KTA is involved in by a young historian, Amy Williams, and her thesis advisor, Bill Nivens, uh, that should be coming out with Yale University Press in 2026. But hard statistics are hard to come by. You know, it, it, it seems now like the majority of the children never saw their parents again. About 60% of their parents were murdered. Um, the... Anecdotally, because the, the Association of Jewish Refugees uh, did a study of kinder in 2001, but you had to be a member of the association in the UK or a member of the KTA in the US and alive to respond to that survey. So it's still somewhat anecdotal. Most of the children stayed, the majority of the children stayed in the UK. Some uh, then went to the US if they had any relatives at all. Um, and then some went to Israel, some went to South and Central America. Some even went back to Europe. I know of some who went back to Vienna or um, the town that Fred Astaire is from. That's not far from Vienna. Um, and yes, there are many different experiences based on how old or how young the children were. So how attached they were to their life before, um, whether their parents survived or not. Um, so a lot of stories have commonalities and yet there are also distinct individual differences in each one. And what percentage would you say completely lost their Jewish identity? I think that's a canard, um, actually. I really have to say that quite strongly. Um, you know, so when I was first working on my film, there was the, one of the very few, there wasn't very much information about the kinder transport. There was a doctoral thesis, an unpublished doctoral thesis. That conclusion was the kinder transport saved the lives of many children, but their souls were lost to the Jewish people. So was it a success, successful mission? Um, you, you are making an assumption that the children had a Jewish identity at home. Right. Some did, some did not. Some were very assimilated German or Jewish families. So um, yes, it's true that many of them were not in Jewish homes. And actually for Orthodox children in the UK, 
they had to get a letter from the parents saying it's okay for my child to be in a not orthodox home. Solomon Schoenfeld was a rabbi who, who rescued a thousand orthodox children by kinder transport and kept them in orthodox hostels. But my mother, who certainly knew she was Jewish, but didn't have a Jewish upbringing per se. She had correspondence class with a rabbi when she was in England, which was more Jewish education than she had at home in Vienna. So I think it's it's important to widen one's sphere of Jewish identity. There's religious, there's cultural, there's all sorts. And I have interviewed hundreds of kinder transport survivors, and most all of them have some kind of Jewish identity, whether it's different from the one that they would have had had they grown up where they grew up is an open question. It's a question the second and third generation are always asking, how would my parent have been different? I will say there was a very prominent priest and his sister, a nun, who in the Sisters of Zion, which was a nun order that has interesting ties to Judaism. They were a couple, a brother and sister on a kinder transport. They're, they're kind of outliers. But um, so yeah, I would I would really push back against that. Did they lose their Jewish identity? Thank you for dispelling that myth because it's one that I think a lot of people hold. Here's a question for Dr. Miro. Susan, can you speak to the different manifestations for 2G and 3G differentiated by whether or not they're 1G parents? and surviving grandparents, if any, talked about their experiences or were silent. And this questioner says, my father and grandparents barely spoke of their experiences. I think I became a child psychiatrist as a way of making sense of my own experiences of the Rene Magritte figure on the right, the cutout. Wow, I haven't read specific information about that question, so I can only answer it personally from my own family. Um, my father never spoke about it, and after he died, I found an uh, album. He was a physician and uh, an ophthalmologist in New York, and I found an album of, well, they were separated pictures in a, in a box. And there were pictures from his childhood and pictures from his entire large Jewish family that was in Sulwaki. And Sulwaki was first Russian and then Polish. And then he left to go to Germany to go to school because they didn't have the proper schools in these shtetl type towns. And uh, he saw what was going on in Germany, he brought himself to the United States and tried to get his relatives out. So every story is different. Um, he only got two brothers out out of uh, nine relatives, and he never talked about it ever, ever in his whole life. And all the things I found were after he died. And I'm a psychiatrist also. So it's not surprising that a lot of the second and third generation people um, have reached out in all kinds of helping professions. Interesting. That come from this known loss um, and not having relatives. You know, the family tree is truncated. I live in a city now that has huge relatives of three generations, the LDS, the Mormons. They have, nobody leaves town eventually. They all come back home. And um, my family tree has a huge cut in it at a, at a very significant branch. So I think that how people look at their life experiences changes as they experience life. And the way I learned a lot about my prejudices, all kinds of interesting quirks in my personality that definitely come from my father's experiences, which he never talked about, and my mother's as well. So that's uh, the best I can do for an answer. Uh, so this question is directed to Dr. Miro, but I think it's for all three of you. And the question is, were there gender differences in the children who were saved by the kinder transport operation? Um, I, I, I just, do you mean gender differences in how girls and boys dealt with their experiences? Right. That's or, right. 
Okay. Because some, some of the figures in your film we saw had been traumatized and damaged. Uh, but yeah, I don't know if there were gender aspects to that. Of course. I mean, certainly, um, you know, in, in some cases, girls were girls were more liable to be used for maids, to be used as maids or childcare, or to be sexually abused in, in the very bad situations. Boys were possibly used for farm labor, um, the older boys. Oh, um, and I also do know of boys who were sexually abused, um, although I think that may have been less likely. Um, and also boys were at risk of the teenage boys being seen as um, being judged as enemy aliens and being transported to um, PO, uh, prisoner of war camps where they were actually interned, a mix of Jewish refugees who had been deemed enemy aliens and uh, captured Nazis. So, and then, then moving into adulthood, when I made my film in the early nineties, at that point, and I can't believe they were, what in their 60s then Rachel and yeah um you know it, the women were much like were much more open to talking about their experience and thing and processing I mean Kurt was amazingly open um so I think there are cultural gender differences for sure and that they yeah there, there were some differences now the 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 first priority to get out of Germany, Austria were teenage boys because they were seen as the most at risk for being sent to concentration camps. So that's that's another thing. Um, and is there any sort of central repository of the names of children saved by the kinder transport program? <laughs> um, I mean, <laughs> ask. <laughs> yeah. No, we've, I've talked with a researcher. We were going to do a big project. We were going to try to raise money to do a big project to try to, to find um, records. No. So for the children who went to the United Kingdom, the Committee for the Care of Refugee Children from Germany, which its successor organization is World Jewish Relief, they have some records. They tended to, uh, when a child w left their care, emigrated to Australia or the US, they tended to destroy the records because they no longer had to keep them because the child was no longer in their care. Um, the um, records from Vienna, the children, which is around between two and 3,000 sent from Austria, are at the Kultusgemeinde and also in uh, Jerusalem, but they're very hard to access. Um, Germany, there are some in Berlin and other towns. There are some great records in various towns in England, but no, it's it's um, there is no central repository. And you know, with with people like even uh, uh, Rachel's family who changed the spelling of their name, or women who changed their maiden names, it's very hard to to trace. Um, yeah. So we're getting to the end of the hour. I'd like to turn to final thoughts and then we'll have a little film clip before we close. So right now, let's start with Dr. Miro. Susan, if you'd like to make some final remarks to our audience today. I'd like to speak to the amazing adaptation of the children. Um, it was overzealously described in the film by the English um, Pathé News folks and other news organizations of how well the children adapted. But the scars of what they endured were not on the surface. And anybody who is interviewed is always a person who feels good enough to be interviewed. So it's important to remember that there are many, many people from all aspects of the Holocaust who would not could not and shouldn't be interviewed to respect their particular issues and scars and how it was for them. And they don't come under to do therapy either. So I think that we have to give people the right to their own adaptations and how they dealt with these traumatic situations like 
the kinder transport, which was both life-giving and life-taking, um, not on purpose, of course. Um, and I think we have to think about that whenever we look at a, a, a large, horrible event, especially if it's man-made. Thank you. Rachel, what would you like to say in closing to our audience? Um, I think this is something that I'm perhaps you know preaching to the choir here about. But as Jews, uh, it's tricky sometimes for other people to understand that Judaism is a religion and the Jewish people are a people and an ethnicity as well as a culture and so on. So that question came up before about uh, people who were raised in homes that didn't necessarily have the same religious or uh, uh, practices. Um, my my family had not been religious. They were culturally Jewish. Um, they didn't become different after that, except that my dad became more English than the English, um, eating Marmite and all these things. Um, and uh, I think that that's one of our challenges as Jews today is to help people understand that we're connected in a variety of ways, but all Jews are not religious, um, even if all religious Jews are Jews. And that Jews come in many, many different shapes and sizes and packages and colors and political uh, leanings and and so on and people need to understand that um, yes and we're all Jewish uh, and that some of the stereotypes we see in the movies and on TV are are very limited uh, somewhat familiar somewhat cringy kind of part of who we are. So Melissa, our filmmaker, who brought us this brilliant pe piece of cinema. Thank you for letting us show it. And what would you like to say in closing? And then I think you have a new film that you'd like to talk about. Right. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you. This is always, it's always a pleasure to reunite with uh, people that uh, were in the film so long ago. I mean, I think as a filmmaker, it's so interesting. I, you know, I'm sure Olivia, you didn't see your trajectory this way, but you know, I, started my film as a student, an undergraduate student with Professor George Stoney, who is an amazing documentary filmmaker. And I thought I would make a little short film about my mother because I knew she was different from other mothers. She had an accent, something had happened to her when she was a child that affected everything about our family. Um, and then, you know, seven years later, I had a feature film, not a short film. So, and then years later, I'm still involved with the kinder transports. Um, and I think I'm really happy with the way the KTA is evolving and doing really good work. And I'm happy to have met Olivia and, and been here for this program. And um, you know, thank you all for coming. And I guess what we're gonna see right now is a trailer for a new short film that I've just finished. It's uh, called 256,000 Miles From Home. It's a look at four kinder who are traveling to Europe on the 80th year, the 80th anniversary of the Kinder Transports. I did not think that I was going to revisit the Kinder Transports, but it happened. Um, and, and if you look in the chat is a link to a film I'm working on now that isn't finished, which is, even though I said I would never make another film about my Holocaust, of my family and the Holocaust, it happened. Um, but so this one, um, the title is a bit metaphorical. As you can see from my first film, I play with titles. Um, one of the kinder in this film worked for NASA and was involved in the mission to the moon. And 256,000 miles is how far the moon is from the earth. And it's also a metaphor for how far the children felt they were from their families and their homes. <laughs> In my recollections, I could just see my classroom and my response to being told that the Jewish children had to leave. And that I suddenly realized that I had been living amongst people who hated me. I wanted to try and imagine what it felt like as a three-year-old toddler to be taken from the arms of his parents and put onto a train. I received a card from the International Red Cross in 1942 saying that your parents were murdered at Auschwitz. I don't know where they're buried, 
if they were buried at all. I think the biggest thing that I would like future generations to learn from our experiences that good people can do a lot of good with the will to do it. It's the biggest lesson you should learn in your life is that if you do, that with any kind of will you can do a lot of good. Great. Well, that's certainly a great lesson to end on, that last piece of the clip. So I would like to thank our three fabulous panelists. I would like to thank you, our loyal audience that comes week after week or whenever we do these programs. Uh, we have the holidays coming up. I wish each of you a sweet holiday and hope very much to see you again on October 27th after the holidays for our next program called The Paper Brigade. So have a wonderful rest of your day, everybody. Bye-bye, everybody. Be well. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.